So the title of my talk today is Open System Science, a new research methodology for open systems problems. But I just start with some, some pictures of 30 years ago. So this is, uh, the weather is uh, similar. <laughs> but the landscape is uh, very much different. And uh, I, I was a bit young. <laughs> And this is a proof that I was teaching over there. <laughs> okay, so I will start the real talk. So today I'd like to share some thoughts on how we should conduct our research toward the future. Looking back on history, in classical period, the center of science was in, in Greek. Greece and uh, Plato, Acad Plato's Academia, and uh, it's the most uh, prototypical school of the, that era, and the most notable examples of flourishing Greek science are Pythagoras, mathematics, Aristotle's uh, natural science, and Archimedes, mathematics. And it was at the time that the concept of grasping things logically was established. Then the center moved to Rome where advances in engineering were achieved, such as civil work, waterworks, and architecture. It was uh, just 16th, 17th century that science and technology finally burgeoned. The representative examples of this age are Copernicus and Galileo's physics and astronomy, and Newton's physics and mathematics. The 17th century saw the establishment of the methodology of modern science based on Descartes' reductionism. This method methodology enormously contributed to science advances from the 18th century and technological progress from 19th century. That is to say, the methodology of modern science can be largely credited with the industrial prosperity and economic development the world has achieved today. It has also advanced medicine and improved our living standards. For this, we are largely indebted to Rune Descartes, who is the father of modern science. In his famous <coughs> discourse on the method published in 1637, uh, he, said, uh, he said four things. Usually, we just remember top three. But I will, I will read this. The first was to never accept anything as true, which I could not accept as obviously true. The second was to divide each of the problems I was examining in as many parts as I could, as many as should be necessary to solve them. The third, to develop my thought in order, beginning with the simplest and easiest to understand matters to the most complex knowledge. We have the fourth one. And the last resolution was to make my enumeration so complete and my review so general that I could be assured that I had not omitted anything. Did you know that uh, we have four? Usually we, we know that the first one, second one, third one. And second one, third one is considered as a reductionism. But the, his true reductionism is with the fourth one, and which is sometimes we uh, forgetting. And uh, nonetheless, there are still, we are credited to him, but uh, nonetheless, there are still plenty of stubborn problems uh, that are not uh, to be easily resolved. The Earth's sustainability issue is an example. 
It involves energy, climate, population, food, biodiversity, poverty, and inequality, safety assurance, etc., which are mutually dependent and cannot be solved independently from the others. Another example is the issue of life and health. All the medical sciences settled almost every issue. There are uh, still the diseases that only develop through the interrelations of complex factors such as cancer, metabolic disorders, and immunodeficiency. Many problems of human bodies have been discovered through molecular biology, neurophysiology, and others. However, the real life also seems stochastic, contingent, and historical. Yet another example is the safety issues of the gigantic man-made social infrastructures, including networks, information infrastructure. The network topology is changing, and new computers and new services are added every day. These infrastructures must continue to serve even in the event of incidences without causing any vital effect on the everyday lives of people. This uh, problem seems to have two common characteristics. The first one is that all these issues are related to the problem resolution, resolution of integrated systems consisting of numerous ever-changing interrelated subsystems. In many cases, we do not even know what subsystems are involved in the problem. The other char char characteristics is that these issues require predicting somehow uh, our future and take actions. For Earth sustainability, we need to predict the future and take actions even though we don't know our, uh, the, the prediction is perfect. For life and health, we predict how well a treatment works and then examine whether it really works. For safety, we need to predict the future and take action so that no danger situation would happen. It was more than 15 years ago, uh, 15 years ago when I started feeling somehow uncomfortable about the methodology of science. I often questioned myself whether life and intelligence can be broken into parts, and if we can, this serves to solve the problem. We knew the double helix structure of genes and neurons, but we can reconstruct life and intelligence from them. When networks spread, and new application programs are added to the networks to work as ultra-distributed infrastructures, how could one know uh, the entire system and its behavior and assure the dependability of such infrastructures? And how could one fix the system in case of an incident? For solving these issues, can we continue the conventional scientific method? Important problems are waiting for practical solutions, whereas solving a problem sometimes worsens the situation for the other problems. Science are sometimes hiding themselves from situations getting worse. Engineers are repeating the same techniques while the effect becomes less and less. Business persons are looking for a chance of hit and run without taking any responsibility on the result. And we feel the lacking of proper expression of overcome the situation. Is something missing? What's wrong? So this is what I'm going to talk today. We believe that we had been doing what Descartes described as scientific methodology. 
But in fact, we had not. Science research domains have been subdivided into narrow areas or silos and conducted by specialists of each area. No one performed the function of checking whether there is anything omitted. That is, we have, ignores, uh, we have ignored Descartes' last item. So this is false reductionism, in fact. Actually, in our professional society of science and technology, there is no specialist who takes care of this function of checking omissions, or no department in the universities of taking this role. And uh, this eventually led us to lack of holistic view. In addition, we now have to investigate not only reproducible issues, but temporal, developmental, and non-reproducible issues. Earth sustainability, life and health, safety issues are all temporal developmental systems and are non-reproducible. We cannot stop or reverse this, these systems. Complex system theories have given the view of time development for each component systems. It extracts one aspect of a system and ex explains the complex behavior by a simple formula. But it does not provide solutions of real complex system by itself. We need to have holistic view with time axis. So there are two. One is, uh, you know, uh, we have to check uh, everything is in there. The second one, one is, uh, you know, we have to attack to time changing systems. Then the question is whether we can really solve these issues or not. Or do we need a new methodology to solve these issues? What in fact characterizes these issues? I consider that these problems are characterized by open systems. Uh, in order to understand open systems, let's compare them with closed systems. A closed system is a system that has no interaction without a world. For a problem of closed system, we can define the more domain of a problem so that we can concentrate our discussion on that region. On the other hand, it has an open system interface interacts with the outer world. For a problem of an open system, we cannot define the domain of a problem, and therefore we cannot confine our discussion on a region. Always we have to think what the system is connected to. So every system is an open system. I'm sorry. In the real world, everything has interactions with the outer world through gravity, air, light, temperature, etc. So every system is an open system. Besides, there are many problems that are simple ones so that it can be treated as closed system. We say that the closed system hypothesis holds for such systems. However, it is not always true that the such hypothesis does hold. Let's take inside. A closed system can consist of subsystems. The structure is simple in that their boundaries are fixed and communication patterns are fixed. Thus, the whole system can be divided into subsystems, and the whole problem is solved by solving subsystems. That's why reductionism worked. An open system also consists of subsystems, whereas the structure is complex in that there are boundaries, numbers, functions, and the interaction patterns are changing time to time. So an open system is a time development 
an irreversible system. The real world is a time development and irreversible system. For problems of open system, it's not easy to divide the system into subsystems, which are changing all the time. Therefore, we need to check all the time whether we had omitted something and whether the boundary structure and relations have changed. Thus, the false reductionism fails for this time. This slide shows the comparison of closed and open systems. Simple, equil equilibrium, reversible, reproducible, can be divided into elements since it is static, can be halted, can take external observer's view. I didn't explain this, but uh, maybe you understand easily. Uh, whereas open systems, open complex, temporal development, irreversible, one time only, non-reproducible, cannot be divided into elements since it's changing all the time, need to keep alive, cannot stop, can take only the internal observer's view. I was thinking whether it's possible to solve a problem of an open system which is complex and ever-changing. Usually, maybe not. It seems to be impossible in the sense that we could give strong and complete solutions uh, to a closed system which is well-defined and static. But we can say probably yes in the sense that we will be able to give a means to make the entire situations better, not worse, through our best effort. So open system science is not that strong, but we have to go and back and go and back and check whether we are okay or not. So this is rather attitude of science than way that we can solve the problem. So believing in this, I proposed open system science, which is an approach to problems of open systems. This approach solves problems while keeping the system alive in, or in operation. We allow divisions of a system into subsystems, provided that all mutual dependencies among subsystems are kept fully if possible, or try as much as possible uh, to, to keep it. This means abstraction without elim elimination, as Descartes described in this last item. We cannot take external observer's view since we are in the system anyhow. This is we need to try our best to maintain the mo model of a system so as to be consistent with new findings in the, world, in the real world. So it must be endless activity through our best effort. Uh, then this approach needs the new perspective of management, not only analysis and synthesis, but management. It is a best effort, time dependent manner of uh, maintaining things. So we have long believed that the notion of management inhabits a totally different sphere than science. But when you think about it, the global environmental problem is how to sustain the Earth. In other words, how to manage Mother Earth. What is life science if not the management of life? Efforts are also needed to counter service out outages and deliberate attacks on the immense internet-connected social infrastructures, and further up upgrades and modifications must be taken into consideration at the initial design stage. Here again, a management perspective is essential. So in order to solve the open systems problems, I propose a three-perspective approach analysis to pursue the basic principles of things, synthesis to build up the whole from the, its element, and management to sustain the whole 
whole system. This three perspective approach is the essence of the method of the open system science. Then the methodology can be described as follows. First one, define the problem and the problem domain on which the problem re reside as much as possible. Construct a model of the problem domain in detail without elimination as much as possible. Apply the problem to the model and see whether it causes any contradiction inside and or with the behaviors of the real system along the time. If it does, revise the model or devise a new model. Or expand, reduce, or change the problem domain if necessary. That we defined at the first item. Repeat until a satisfactory result is obtained. So do go this loop. And if I just take a comparison of a discourse on the method and open system science, this is, uh, you know, on top of this, we adjust the domain and check whether it's okay and uh, doubt myself all the time. So this is an endless effort. Okay, I'll skip. Let us think uh, what computer system supports the methodology of uh, open system science. Computers are good in database and computing. That is, we can preserve all the data and findings in a database and can use it to check that anything is omitted. We can also use it to check whether any new findings support our proposition or give contradictions. We can also use computers to compute uh, this side, uh, time developmental systems. That is to say, by using computers, we can compute the model and maintain the model of a target system so as to match the data obtained from the real system by dynamically adding to and changing the model. Then the procedure can be seen on this slide. Uh, the item one to five is the same as what I, show, uh, I showed uh, in the previous slides. But starting with here, there's a real system. And let's think about the current target. We need, anyhow, to set up some current target. And then we have accumulated data, or we need to accumulate data. Um, from this data, we'll establish micro theories and then uh, uh, set up a computational model and compute and get the result and check whether you know the the result shows the no contradiction and they give some uh, good result we'll check and uh, if it's not good then we need to revise micro theories, uh, computational model, and go back to this one. But sometimes we need to go back to, to here, the current target. This is uh, related to number four. Uh, re uh, expand, reduce, or change the system, the problem domain, if necessary. Sometimes it's very difficult to to give a solution to the, to the existing target or a predefined target. But uh, if we move the target or change the target a little bit, then we can have a better view of the real system so that we can get uh, better micro theories, uh, better computational model, and get a result. Okay, sorry. As you may have recognized, there are two new 
thoughts in this procedure. The first is that it, if the result is, does not match the behavior of the real system, we do not only rely on changing parameters to make the match, we do rather re revise base theory and computational model. This is done by human. The second is that I explained that uh, we need to change the, the target if we are not satisfied with the, with the result. This is also done by human. Those two thoughts are quite coherent to the notion of open system and solving open systems problems. By using uh, this framework, we can predict our future in an explain explain exp explainable way, and the accuracy of the future prediction can be gradually improved. Of course, we can reason past event better. We can apply this to various targets, as shown on the slides, like uh, climate, uh, life, and disaster, uh, economy, and policy making, and so forth. And this methodology of open system science is not just contemplation, but has been applied to various real researches. Rather, it is a fruit of long and diverse discussion with researchers at Sony Computer Science Laboratories and other through investigating various concrete research topics. For this, I am very much indebted to them. I'd like to present a few examples of how this methodology has been applied to each research topics. But before going to, to example, I'd like to briefly refer to Sony Computer Science Laboratory. Uh, Sony Computer Science Lab was established in 1988 by me and the colleagues uh, Dr. Doi of Sony Corporation. And we expanded to Paris in 1996, and we have an uh, interaction laboratory inside CSL Tokyo in 1999. The goal is to contribute extensively to social and industrial and Sony's development in this order through fundamental yet applicable research, especially on and around computer science. And uh, we are very small but excellent members. Actually, we only have three zero thirty researchers and some students. And freedom and respect on the individual's responsibility, openness toward outer community, of course, independent recruiting process from Sony Corporation. So that's why a Sony Computer Science Laboratory incorporate as a different entity from Sony Corporation. And this is uh, based on annual contract. Of course, it is renewable. We first uh, focused on, on computer science as the name of our lab shows. So we did a distributed operating system, a network, interfaces, and augmented reality, and so forth. For example, uh, the result of a distributed Object-oriented operating system has been used for Sony's product for long, uh, such as uh, IBO entertainment robots and uh, some digital satellite receivers and so forth. So we contributed to, to Sony, of course. But then, after 10 years, we think that most of the fundamental research has been done for computer science. So we will expand our focus to more towards science and more toward engineering science for systems biology, system brain science, econophysics, <coughs> and interaction like a real world computing, emotional interaction, interactive music, and visual computing. And then recently, we are getting into the third decade already. So we did a further extension to open system science, which is, uh, uh, consists of fundamental research interaction and sustainability. So this is actually new. Fundamental science, system biology, systems eco economy, 
systems neuroscience, uh, visual computing, interactive music, real world computing, cybernetic earth. This is the integration of all the, uh, the information related uh, systems with the real world computing. And then those are uh, rather new. Open energy solution, global modeling and simulation. This is a kind of open system simulation. Healthcare solution and cybernetic uh, human. So we are expanding the research focus quite a bit. But uh, in relation uh, to open system science in Sony Computer Science Laboratories, those uh, people, this is, uh, we have more, but uh, those are leading researchers. Uh, uh, Hiroaki Kitano, the systems biology, and the epigenetics by um, Sakurada and Ken Mogi for system brain science, uh, Takayas for econophysics, uh, Rekimoto for cybernetic earth, and this guy Sasaki is doing uh, global modeling, uh, and the example is pandemic uh, simulation, and uh, Langish uh, Luke Steele, uh, he's from uh, Sony CSL Paris. And reflexive interaction is a musician and also a computer scientist. Um, François Pache is from uh, Sony CSL Paris. So I will just uh, touch upon a little bit on each of those. A system biology is a new method of biological study established by one of my colleagues, Dr. Kitano. He shed light on the essence of life by defining it in terms of management of a huge functional uh, network, taking an individual's interaction with its environment into consideration. He started to collect the research result of molecular biology experiments available on the literature and organized so-called pathway networks. It's a network. Then he analyzed the network and found many properties of life as a system. He established this theory of bio, uh, biological robustness. Then he proposed a long tail drugs and personalized medicine, which is not the medication by silver bullet panacea, but by a combination of many medicines, hopefully with uh, inexpensive ones tailored to each patient. Okay, so when he analyzed the network, seems that uh, there is a choke point. Choke point is uh, more important for continuing their life. So uh, from the point of uh, view for, for medication, it's very good to target this part. But if you miss hit the place, then he or she may die. So what he did is uh, more to the long tail one and uh, putting uh, medicine to, to a non-critical part. But when it gets into this part, it's really effective. So this is safe and cheap and we can change the medicine if it doesn't fit. fit. And this is also very good for personalized uh, medication. So, uh, uh, according to him, uh, this is a target, much better than target-based uh, drug. Uh, this is, if it fits very good, it's okay. But if it doesn't hit, then it's very difficult to recover from that. And only the hit ratio is 5 or 10 or up to 20. So 80% people are getting worse. according to him. And uh, system biology is further being extended by another colleague, Dr. Sakurada, who is one of the first inventors of human IPS, induced pluripotent stem cells. He has formulated a new theory of life by incorporating an epigenetics perspective. 
Epigenetics is a functional change of gene to be conveyed without accompanying change of DNA sequences, which is acquired through one's life, whereas genetic is inherent to trait. So he said that, of course, gene is important, but after gene is very important. It's a historical per person, but also some of that uh, characteristics can be inherited from father and mother without changing gene strings. And that is, he took internal irreversible structural change caused by an individual development into consideration to understand life. So he wants to do individual and historical medication. And he and this has given a base for the tailor-made drugs and medication according to patients' environmental and clinical history. We expect the theory of epigenetics will give a deep insight into the nat nature, nurture issues. I'll briefly touch upon the cybernetic Earth. Jun Rik Rikimoto sees the future of the Earth as one cybernetic system consist consisting of sensors, that is, sensors, actuators, networks, computers, database, simulators, and maybe a brain machine direct interface, BMI. It will be a very complex living system as considered as a huge creature. We don't know how to control such an open system now. However, we'll not be able to stop that happens. So, uh, we need to predict what will happen and then how to manage it and live in symbiosis with that. And Taka Sasaki is trying to do a pandemic modeling, uh, which, is, uh, which includes uh, geological, climate, social, and many other systems that are involved. And this cannot solve by reductionism only. Hence, he started modeling holistic simulation. The result is, is yet to come but we expect a big breakthrough on this research topic. So, for example, this is uh, pandemic modeling, but it consists of population dynamics, social network, traveling and transportations, cohort effect, past pandemic, immune system, virus, receptor reaction, host dependency, uh, genome evolution, other host species, cattle breeding and wildlife and seasonality, locality, climate, uh, geology, so many, many things. And it's impossible to start with everything. Uh, we start with one and add and add. So we need a new simulation system that can add new uh, systems into into the existing one. Uh, let's go to the next example. While the approach to, of Chomsky was dominant, with, uh, uh, which forced linguistics into framework of classical reductionism, Luke Steele's adopted the hypothesis that language is complex, adaptive, and open system. He developed the paradigm of evolutionary linguistics. The basic framework of this approach is to simulate language games using multiple agents. The speaker uses some element of language, for example a word, to achieve a particular cooperative goal, for example drawing attention to an object. And the game succeeds if the goal has been achieved. If so, the linguistic Conventions are reinforced, otherwise the lexicon and grammar are updated in order to be more adaptive for subsequent games. 
So initial research focused on the perceptually grounded categories and lexicons, but the experiments have moved to physical robots. Uh, those are physical robots and real, real uh, shape and color and noise and so forth. And uh, that in integrate the vision and embodiment as more complex grammatical language. Language is here seen as an open system. Okay, next one is that I've been involved in a Japanese government project as a research supervisor. This project is to develop a dependable open, I mean, dependable systems. Uh, the, we used to think that we could have a complete specification of software and its implementation, and we could know what would be happening in the system so that we could control the system. However, the reality is that the specification and the implementations are incomplete, and the environment and requir requirement are changing in operation. So, so incomplete and uncertain. So I have given a new general approach to build such dependable systems in which I incorporated the total management of design, manufacturing, operating, maintaining, and improving process from the beginning, in addition to elemental technologies and system architectures. And I defined open system defined dependability as the ability to perform continuously the effort to remove those factors, those factors and incomplete, incomplete factors and uncertainty factors before they cause failures and to provide appropriate and quick action when failures occurs in order to minimize the damage so that the system provides safely and continuously the uh, services expected by the users and to maintain accountability for the system operations and processes. So this is, again, a three-dimensional system like uh, elemental technology, system architecture, and process management. I'm going to give a uh, detailed explanation tomorrow in my tomorrow's, tomorrow uh, lecture. Okay, so now I'd like to conclude my, uh, my speech. I raised that the remaining issues of great urgency are most, mostly open systems uh, problems, and we need to solve such problems while keeping the system alive or running as a method or attitude uh, to solve such problems. I propose open system science in which a new perspective of management is added to conventional perspectives of analysis and synthesis. Then I gave the definition of methodology of open system science. I also showed what computer can support well to solve open system problems and proposes a general framework. Finally, I showed some example of method being applied in establishing a new research area new research area. I believe this uh, methodology for open system problem can be applicable to a wide range of real problems that we need to solve now for us and for the next generation. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>